Um, well, I'm, I'm really grateful to be here uh, among such an incredible set of speakers. I'm so honored. Thank you for having me. Um, so I'm really excited to talk to you all today about a particular type of data that I really enjoy working with and I'm really excited about, and, and this title will make a lot more sense at the end of my talk. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm the director of the data visualization group at Boku, uh, where we work a lot with open source technologies. Uh, and our group more specifically works on kind of the full range of data science and visualization uh, on the web. Uh, and just a little shameless plug, we're also running a conference called OpenVizConf in April, all about how to do data visualization on the web. So check it out if you're interested in learning more about data viz. Um, so I'm here to talk about uh, a form of data that you all probably run into all the time, every single day. So aside from images, which I absolutely spend a lot of time looking at, just like everyone else, um, I also like to read the news. Um, and so, I, you know, I'll read the New York Times, and you know, I might run into an article like this about uh, fe about women uh, at times of war. And I'll read the article, and there'll be a story there, but there'll be lots of other things that I bring to this article from my own experience. There's the context of my life, there's history and what I know about it, there's other events in the news that are influencing um, what I know about this article. Um, and so there's lots of things that I, can, that, that, um, I project beyond the text alone. Um, and so uh, the thing is that text is something that we work with every single day. Text is something that we see, that we read, that we consume. Uh, my Twitter feed is completely unmanageable at this point. I'm sure it is for a lot of other people too. Uh, and the reality is that it's just so much easier to generate text. Uh, even my mother has been tweeting, so you know, that's weird. Um, and so, uh, so text is data too. And so understanding it and finding ways to analyze it and work with it and derive meaning without having to read everything uh, is becoming a really important problem. And so when I talk about text, I want to talk about two different categories. One, the idea of just a single document. And when I say document, I mean anything that's just a collection of words that makes sense in some form. It could be an article, it could be a piece of legislation, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, in addition to that, I will also talk about collections of documents. So this is, uh, you know, where a library of books or maybe all of the articles in the New York Times today come into play. Uh, and the kind of questions that we ask about both of them are going to be very different. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about different analysis and visualization techniques that we can apply because the reality is in data visualization is that it's always better when you, when you can apply some interesting analysis to it first, right? We've all gone beyond simple counts and averages and, and we know why. Uh, and the same thing is true uh, for improving data visualization itself. So I want to cover a, little, a few different topics in single documents and then switch to collections. So, the first thing that when I say text, I really just mean some narrative. These are the first three paragraphs from Alice in Wonderland, uh, which is a great book if you haven't read it. Uh, and the easiest thing to do is to, to get some measurements about it, right? So um, I can take all the words that appear in those three paragraphs and I can just count how many of them appear, right? So you can see the top words is the, it, and to, not particularly significant, uh, although there are some arguments we made there that they could be. Uh, but uh, words like rabbit and Alice are probably significant because they're players in, in, in the book and the fact that you know they appear in this, these first three paragraphs might mean that they're important. And so you know the first thing you can do is just make a tag cloud, which I'm sure everyone has seen. There was a time on the web where everybody made tag clouds of everything. It was really overwhelming. Uh, but this is also not great because we know the book is about Alice in Wonderland, so it's not surprising that Alice is a big word in there. Uh, it also doesn't tell us very much about what happens to Alice. We know she interacts with some characters like a king and a queen, but we don't know what they are. Uh, and we kind of lose the meaning of the text behind it. Nonetheless, this is really interesting to get like an initial glimpse into what might be in your, in your text data. Now, this becomes really uh, much more interesting, even just basic accounting, when you look at change over time. So if you've never played with Google Trends, it's a fantastic way to burn an hour of your life, at least. Um, and, and Google Trends just let you look at how you know, people are searching their search behavior and how that changes over time. So in this example, I uh, started comparing the, the changes between beards, mustaches, and goatees. And uh, on the top blue line there is beards, so you know it's winning. And uh, Google conveniently also uh, adds little articles to various peaks and valleys to kind of uh, highlight things that are important. So for example, uh, at that point in time, um, hipster beards were being blamed for poor razor sales. You know, that's <laughs> definitely an important piece of information. Uh, but it's great because just with this very basic technique of counting over time, you know, we can see some potentially really interesting changes. 
Now, um, obviously, these basic measures um, are great, but sometimes we want to um, really start digging into the text a little bit more. And one way to do that is to look at the structure of the text that we're using, right? So the first thing I want to say about structure is just where do things appear in the text, right? So for example, I'm looking again at the entire book of Alice in Wonderland and representing that in that large rectangle. And then I can search for a specific word and it'll just show me a line of the relative to the, to the text where um, instances of that word appear. So here I'm searching for the word king in the top one and I can see it appears towards the end. And then on the bottom, uh, I'm looking for the word Alice and it's just all over because obviously uh, it's about Alice in Wonderland. And then I can see where the caterpillar appears and so on. And this is a really great technique to just very quickly see whether there's certain parts of a text um, where specific topics appear, whether there's some kind of a boilerplate language that might be used. Um, just a really quick and very simple visualization to, um, to create. Um, but more interestingly, what we can do is uh, called part of speech tagging. Um, and as you know, obviously words, they all have different roles, right? There's, there's verbs and nouns and uh, things of that nature, and there's actually lots and lots of different parts um, that uh, I'm not even sure what some of them mean. But it's very easy to take a bunch of text and actually put it through a part of speech tagger that's going to produce text um, that is then labeled with one of these many, um, uh, many roles. And so we worked on a really interesting project um, that I'll show some screenshots of uh, called Stereotropes, where we worked with this community of uh, content creators on uh, TV tropes, folks that are really passionate about tropes in films and media. And by tropes, I mean things like damsel in distress and, super, and action hero, um, just stereotypes that we're all used to. And these folks would sit down and really narrate these beautiful descriptions um, of what these tropes are, just really describing them. Um, and the best part is that they were so interested in these uh, that they would use really uh, lots and lots of adjectives, right? Which is a really great way to uh, understand how some of these tropes um, m might be described. Conveniently, a lot of these tropes were also tagged as being primarily male or primarily female. And so we built this uh, exploratory visualization that you can all check out if you look for stereotropes. Um, where you can go and take a look at some of these tropes and see how they've evolved over time, what kind of words are being used to describe them, even more importantly. So for example, if I'm looking at the damsel in distress trope, uh, I can see some adjectives that are used to describe it. So the ones that are closer to me from that side are ones that are more unique to this particular trope. So for example, the adjective play along. Uh, whereas the ones further away, uh, like good, are ones that are just more generic. They're used in a lot of other tropes. And so then we could also use those to connect to other tropes to kind of create networks of tropes and things of that, of that nature. Um, and then because we also had all these adjectives that were tagged because of the tropes they were in, we could now look at the overall adjective body um, and look at how they compare between male and female adjectives, which is really cool because we could start seeing patterns that we absolutely see in our culture, like women being described as cute and young and men being, being described as strong and for some reason white. Um, and, uh, but this gave us this really beautiful um, overview directly you know, from the highest level of, of language into our, our corpus. So really fun to play with. Um, we've, we've sunk many hours into just browsing through it, so, um, so check it out. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is the relationships of words, right? So far we've been looking at individual words or kind of a structure as a whole, but obviously words have relationships to each other or we would have a really tough time talking to each other. So the best way to look at that is in, with co-occurrence. Um, and this particular visualization technique called the phrase net, a phrase network, was uh, a part of a project called Many Eyes. And the way it works is you specify a pattern by saying word, one word and second word and then some connector word in between them. So in this case, this is looking at James Joyce's portrait as an artist as a young man. And the pattern is word one and word two. And words that appear together in this pattern are connected by an arrow. And the thicker the arrow, the more often that pattern appears. Uh, and then the bigger the word, the more often that word appears overall. So for example, you could see that father and mother appeared much more than mother, mother and father. Now this is interesting, especially when applied to like very specific patterns and data sets. So for example, this is the Old Testament and the pattern is X begat Y. Turns out you can get the entire lineage of the Bible by just crunching it through this particular pattern. It's a bit of a loop there because people use the same name twice, but um, it's a little bit confusing, but otherwise pretty accurate. And we didn't have to read the Bible at all to do this. Um, <laughs> 
And, uh, you can, and you can actually get a lot of information by just looking at some really common patterns, like this is the pattern X of Y applied to the Old Testament and the New Testament. And you can pretty clearly tell which one is which by just looking at some of the words and the way they're connected, right? So uh, one is the old and one is the new. Um, and then another really interesting visualization is one called a word tree that, again, uses the connections with just the sequence, just one word appearing after the other, um, and then breaking them up into trees based on the number of occurrences that are happening. So, for example, uh, this is, again, looking at Alice in Wonderland, uh, and the, you always pick a root word from which to start building your tree. In this case, I picked the word O, uh, and you can see O oh, deer appears at least twice, um, and then those kind of continue to break down. So, again, a really interesting way to especially look at things like what are some verbs attributed to a particular character? Or what are some adjectives that appear, um, you know, in relation to a certain object or, or noun? Um, so those are just a few things you can do on individual documents. Now, collections of documents is where it gets really interesting because you can read a single document, even if it's really long, but when you have thousands of thousands of documents, it becomes much harder. And most of the time, you want to try to figure out how to group them, you want to figure out what's in them, uh, and you want to try and figure out how to compare them because ideally, you have some task in mind. So uh, the first thing I'll talk about is a, a significance of words. Um, and so uh, to give you an example, if um, I'm looking at the word cat, uh, and this is great, uh, we, we didn't coordinate this, but the, the cat theme, uh, very strong today. Um, if you see the word, an occurrence of the word cat inside of a New York Times article, that's probably significant. It probably means that that article was written about cats. But if you see the word cat in an article in Cat Weekly magazine, it's probably not that significant because every article in Cat Weekly magazine is about cats. I'm assuming that's a magazine that exists. Now, that means that that word is probably not significant and you want to look for words that are, that are they're going to be much more uh, important. And so using a, a pretty basic technique called TFIDF, what you can do is you can actually compare the term frequency alongside with how many documents this term appears in overall in your corpus. So this is a really, really older project called uh, Female Created by Fernando Vegas that I just really love. Um, and it just looks at correspondence, email correspondence between two people. And what it, uh, what it does is it just looks at um, uh, every column is a month and it'll just pick out these most significant words um, at every month. And what you can see in the larger picture um, is that these two colleagues who generally just work together, uh, one of them has gone on a trip abroad for three months. And so suddenly these words that are not, would not necessarily be that frequent over the full cor corpus of their correspondence really surfaced up, right? So she was in Bali and in Malaysia, and they were writing, and she was writing about, um, about her trip. And then as soon as she was back, it kind of went back down to some of the terms that they always write about, like Excel. Um, and then the same thing in the smaller uh, image, at some point someone had a, a baby, and so suddenly the correspondence about that got much larger. So it's a really, really interesting technique to get at some of those significant words. Um, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about grouping, which is a really cool uh, problem. Uh, and there's a couple of different techniques here. The first one is this idea of, topic of, a, um, of a, a building classifiers. So, um, the way a classifier works is very similar to what we just saw with the images. You, have, you want to train something to recognize a cat, uh, so you give it lots of examples of cats, and then you, once you give it some other un, you know, image that it hasn't been trained on before, it'll tell you whether it's a cat or not. Same thing for text. You can give it lots of documents, for example, news articles that are classified as being different subjects, and it'll train you a classifier, at the end of which you can give it a new article, and it'll tell you what it's about. Now, this was a cool technique that we tried to use a while ago uh, uh, at IBM Research to try and make congressional legislation more fun to read. That's a really hard thing to do. Um, but also, more importantly, we wanted to figure out if we could find writers, sections and bills that, that did not belong there based on the topic that they, um, that they were in. And so uh, what we were able to do is kind of take bills that each belong to a category, like a finance bill, and train a classifier to be able to detect bills, and then take individual section of bills and pipe it through this classifier. And this is an example of finding a really uh, egregious um, example. This was a bill about protecting consumers from predatory lending practices by credit card companies. And every single block is a, a, you know, is a section of the legislation. And then towards the bottom in the last two versions, you see these brown sections, uh, which turned out had to do with protecting Americans from violent crime, allowing folks to bring in semi-automatic uh, rifles into national parks. Arguably not about credit card protection, although I don't know. Um, <laughs> And so this is clearly an example of some political process by which uh, things like this got added to our legislation that may, you know, may not need to be there. So this is a, a really fun example. We did not make legislation more fun to read. Uh, it's still really hard. 
Um, another really cool technique that uh, we see a lot of use of today is called topic modeling. And topic modeling is a great way to just try and say, uh, if you look at all the text that I have, what are some words that appear together that are likely logically related to each other? And so topic modeling works by way of just me saying, oh, I think I have 10 topics here. Can you, can you break down the words that I have and give me some of these clusters together? Um, so this is an example of uh, looking at all of JSTOR's articles. Um, and we can see lots, I know it's a little small to see, but um, a lot of these circles represent these clusters of words that um, appear together. And some, some are very clearly related, though, about, leg about legislation or about crime or things like that. So uh, it's a really, especially if you're not sure what the categorization is within your, your, your document collection, it's an excellent way to try and explore and see um, uh, whether there is some kind of a logical grouping you're unaware of. And then you can start looking at, uh, for example, change over time of topics, which is really interesting, for example, in literature, right? Because even if we look at a body of fiction, the way we, the way we write fiction over time probably changes with the time that it's written in, right? Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, and then uh, the last grouping I'll talk about is comparison. How do you compare different documents to each other? Um, so, uh, you know, at first I talked about counts, right? Really simple technique. But for example, this is looking at two different, uh, um, uh, during, the, the, during the election, uh, the rhetoric from both the Democratic and Republican Party and just the words that they used. And the split corresponds to who used it more, right? So the Democrats obviously said the word Obama more. Um, uh, but at the same time, you can see that certain words were just used more by other people. So, for example, uh, women and middle class was used more by uh, the Democratic Party, whereas government and business were being used more by the Republican Party, right? And that's really interesting because you can very quickly see some themes that we kind of knew existed and actually confirmed them with, you know, the, the rhetoric that people were using. Um, in a more complex way, uh, uh, a technique we can use is, is called similarity, to compute similarity between documents. And what we do is just we decompose documents into the words that appear in them, right? So this first one has the word cat five times, and then house, and dog, and monkey. Um, and then you turn them into term vectors. So this first one, uh, first one represents that document, and then the term vectors represent the full set of all the words you have and how many times they appear in them. And then you use cosine similarity, and that's just one possible measure of similarity. There's actually a lot of uh, really interesting work done to, to find better similarities. But basically what we're trying to do is figure out how big the angle is between our vectors. Uh, and the smaller the angle, the closer, the more similar things are. So this was applied in a really interesting way by uh, a fellow named uh, Jonathan Stray um, to look at um, logs from the Iraq War, so logs about military action. Um, and what uh, he did is he took the three most significant words, so again, using that significance measure, um, and used those to build those term vectors and then try to link documents together um, that you know, were similar in that way. So you could very cl clearly see clusters like truck and tanker, which had to do with uh, you know, particular military action around those um, and, and various other um, uh, kind of co-occurrences of you know, female or, or uh, police, things like that. So again, looking at this really large body of text that nobody was really building in a way that assembled it in any way, um, but then actually finding kind of hidden structure in it, which is really cool. Um, and then uh, kind of this last example, I believe, uh, of another technique similar to this called log likelihood. Um, and this is looking at the top five words of uh, music titles from every decade. Um, so uh, you can see in the 1970s, uh, uh, we had a lot of disco and rock and modern day times, we have some work to do to um, write better, better <laughs> musical titles. So hopefully uh, I gave you a bit of a glimpse of the kinds of cool things you can do with text um, and uh, that it's a really interesting body of, of, of data to work with and we have lots of it. So thank you so much.